Greetings, everyone, and welcome back to our Sky Tonight program. This is Seth Mayo, curator of astronomy for the Loma Planetarium at MOAS. And in this edition of the program, we are covering the dates of November 21st through November 27th. We're going to start things off by talking about that exciting Artemis 1 launch from NASA to the moon. I had a chance to be there in person. I'll show you a video I took through a telescope only three miles away. Then we're going to talk about that wonderful revelation from the James Webb Space Telescope of the most distant object ever observed so far. And we're going to say hello to the star cluster Pleiades now rising out of the northeast. So let's get to it. Now, last week was an exciting week for spaceflight history because finally NASA's Artemis 1 mission finally took off with the massive Space Launch System rocket SLS finally leaving the Kennedy Space Center on a trip to the moon. This was an uncrewed test flight to test NASA's new heavy lift rocket and the Orion crew capsule. This is a spacecraft that will eventually take people to the moon. And this has been a long time coming, many years of development, a lot of funding was put into this, a lot of hard work from engineers, technicians, scientists from all around the United States and even the world to make this accomplishment a possibility. And I was fortunate to be there at the launch in the wee hours of the morning. It was at 1.47 a.m. Eastern Standard Time at Kennedy Space Center. I was at the NASA press site about three miles away, kind of near the countdown clock. And I've seen many launches there. And I'll have to tell you, this launch was one of the most amazing and breathtaking launches I have ever seen. It truly was the loudest and the brightest launch I've seen. I've seen many different rocket launches from the Space Shuttle, Falcon 9, Falcon Heavy, Atlas launches, Delta launches, and this SLS rocket by far was the loudest and most powerful I had ever seen. And one thing I like to do, and you may have seen it on our channel from time to time, is take a telescope out to the press site and track the launch with a very magnified and up close view. I used an eight inch telescope with an Xbox controller connected to it that allowed me to manually track the liftoff. And it was so amazing. Here in this video, you can see this is in slow motion. This is 120 frames per second. So about four times slower than real time, but it really shows you the beauty, the power and the technological prowess it took to launch something like this. You can see the liftoff and then the flames from the two saw rocket boosters and the four core main engines that are connected to that orange fuel tank. Altogether, adding up with a launch thrust of about 8.8 .8 million pounds, it's the most powerful rocket ever launched. And what's really interesting is those main engines were actually retired from the shuttle days. As we pan up, you actually see the Orion crew capsule at the top. Of course, it's uncrewed for this launch, but there's mannequins inside and other testing equipment, so we know it's safe for future travel with real astronauts. And as we move through the video, you can see the rocket reaching higher and higher altitudes in the sky. It was amazing all the way through, just being there in person. The rumble in the chest was just extraordinary, and it was so, so loud. Again, it's one of the loudest rockets I've ever heard, and it was really, really bright. It almost seemed like there was a new sunrise happening over Cape Canaveral in the middle of the night. Even though I was tired, it really woke everyone up. It was very, very exciting. And as the rocket went up, you can actually see that I caught booster separation. So eventually those solid rocket boosters jettison away and you can see them kind of coming down, this really neat kind of shower of sparks and an exhaust plume kind of trailing behind. It's really cool. And then you see the core stage continue on as it eventually made its way into space. And not long after launch, cameras on the Orion spacecraft took images of Earth as it was flying away. And it's starting to get closer and closer to the moon. By Monday, it should get to the moon, get really close to it, and then enter into a much larger orbit. This is a full 25 and a half day mission with the finale of the Orion capsule coming back to Earth on re-entry and then a splashdown into the ocean. This is a really nice graphic from NASA kind of showing the orbital trajectory of the Artemis 1 mission. And it starts here with the launch from Kennedy Space Center there, kind of makes its way around the Earth and then continues on. And actually at a certain point, there were a whole bunch of CubeSats that were deployed from various organizations and research institutions. And then the Orion spacecraft with its deployed solar arrays made its way to the moon. The first approach to the moon, it gets really close to it, actually just within 60 miles of the surface. So there's gonna be some really good pictures of that. And then it loops around the moon and then Orion makes its way into a much larger, what they call retrograde orbit around the moon, testing an orbit that had never been done, at least with people. Then it makes another close flyby of the moon kind of later on in the mission and it loops around and then heads back to Earth for final re-entry with the Orion crew capsule there 
and back to Earth once more. So it'll be exciting to see all the different milestones during the mission, and we'll find out the results of it soon, paving the way for future lunar missions, possibly with people. So definitely had to share that with you all. It was a really cool launch, great experience, and even better, the last quarter moon was out that evening too, kind of really solidifying the destination of where Artemis is going. Very recently, we got some very exciting news from astronomers using the James Webb Space Telescope that we've had a chance to talk about a lot this year, since of course we're first seeing pictures of it here in 2022. And already we are seeing so many things never seen before and reaching levels of distant observations never achieved before in all of astronomy. And this has only been six months since the observing campaign really began with this new space-based observatory. So just last week, some studies were released showing the most distant objects ever observed and really the oldest objects ever observed in the universe. And it's actually a place in the sky that is out right now at this time of the year. So this is about in the early evening, looking towards the south. If you're in more southern latitudes, it's a little easier to see. You actually find Jupiter right here and Saturn as well. And just below that, right about here, is a relatively obscure constellation called Sculptor. The stars make this kind of faint triangle. Sculptor is really supposed to represent the workplace of a sculptor. There it is. But in this area is a famous galaxy cluster. This galaxy cluster, which we'll find here, is normally called Pandora's Cluster, also known as Abel 2744. So it's located in that region of the sky. Of course, a super distant object. The cluster itself is about 4 billion light years away, and this is very, very distant. But this is the area recently observed, showing us the most distant objects ever seen. So here's a couple areas within the galaxy cluster Abel 2744, and already you can just see all of the galaxies captured in the view. It's amazing. The James Webb Space Telescope sees an infrared light, and since the universe is expanding, some of that light is now stretched into the infrared, so it's well suited for looking at very distant galaxies. And the farther back you look, actually the further back in time you're seeing an object because the light had to take time to travel from the object to get to us. And on the left here you find one part of the cluster and you notice this little red dot right there. And believe it or not, that is a galaxy, a very early galaxy. Here is the inset kind of zoomed in just a little red smudge here. And what we're seeing here is this galaxy as it looked about 450 million years after the Big Bang. Just as a reminder, the Big Bang happened about 13.8 billion years ago. That's the beginning of our universe. And so of course that is very old and very distant. The light had to travel about 13.3, maybe 13.4 billion light years to finally get to us. Now keep in mind the universe is expanding. That distance is now much greater today, but light can only travel at a finite speed. So for light, it has traveled those 13.4 billion light years. And the Z right here tells you the redshift. That actually kind of tells you its age and also its distance. So as objects are moving away, the light is stretched. We actually call that redshifting because you're moving more towards the redder side of a spectrum. And the redshifting tells you that it's moving away from us, but also how far away it is. And so the Z number is very, very important in looking at very distant objects. The higher the number, the more the redshift has occurred. This is a very high redshift number. Again, this is 450 million years after the Big Bang. The record for the most distant and oldest object came from observations from the Hubble Space Telescope and the Keck Observatory in Hawaii. It's called GNZ11 was an object we found existing 400 million years after the Big Bang. So that had the current record. But if we look to the right here, this is another area of this galaxy cluster, and you'll find another red dot. This one's even smaller here. Right there is another galaxy, a very early low mass galaxy, because these early galaxies are probably not that large, so it took some time for them to get larger or larger galaxies to form in the early universe. This has a redshift of 12.5. That's the highest we had ever seen. The previous record was 11.1 .1 with that GNZ11 object. So this object we're seeing about 350 million years after the Big Bang, even farther away and even older. And what's surprising for astronomers is that we didn't think galaxies this old would be this bright because early in the universe, the universe was dark. We actually call it the dark ages before stars really ignited and really were shining light all throughout the universe. 
It turns out, we think that stars could have started forming about 100 million years after the Big Bang. And that's actually relatively quickly, quicker than we thought the stars would form, and then form into galaxies. Even though these are small galaxies, they are much brighter than we'd ever anticipated. So we're rewriting our understanding of the early universe and how bright stars could really be by looking at these little red smudges that have extreme redshifts that tell us that they're really old and that they're really far away. So this still needs to be confirmed with other techniques, specifically called spectroscopy, where you can really study the elemental makeup of these objects. But right now, this is very intriguing evidence for some of the most distant and oldest objects, and it could get even better than this. This is just the first six months of observing campaign for JWST. Just imagine years in advance when we get better at using this space telescope, how much farther into the universe we're gonna actually see. And that's gonna really kind of wind the clock back and tell us the story of how our universe came to be. The whole story of it is very important to understanding where we are now and maybe what the future will look like. Just by looking at these little red smudges in galaxy clusters that are billions of light years away. I think this is a good reminder that astronomy is just really cool. And one last thing I wanna mention is something a little more casual, but still really great to see at this time of the year. And as you get out in the early evening sky, not long after sunset, you look towards the east or the northeastern part of the sky, you'll start to see here in November, a beautiful grouping of stars you've probably seen before, known as the Pleiades Star Cluster. And every time I see this rising in the evening, I know that winter is getting closer, at least for us here in the Northern Hemisphere. I love this cluster. It looks so cool. And you can see it for most of the night at this time of the year. November and December are your best times to see Pleiades because you can, again, see them almost all night long. This cluster is also known as the Seven Sisters, named after the seven daughters of the Titan named Atlas. And to a lot of folks, it looks like the Little Dipper. And it really does have that appearance, like a little spoon in the sky. It's technically not Little Dipper. That's in the north, where the North Star is located but it does have that similar shape. So you could call it your own very little dipper in the sky if you wanted to. No one's stopping you from thinking that, but it is technically called Pleiades or the Seven Sisters. This is an open cluster of stars about 444 light years away of really hot blue stars that are shining and lighting up the dust that just so happens to be in front of it from our point of view, making it look even more brilliant than it already is. And it really shines. It's the most famous and easily observed star cluster in the entire night sky. And it's part of a famous winter constellation you know as Taurus the Bull. It actually lies along the back of Taurus here. That's a wintertime constellation. So again, a reminder that winter is getting closer to us. We're getting into that part of the year, that season. And not long after you see Pleiades rise, just so you know, this is the planet Mars rising as well. So there's a lot to see here, but specifically Pleiades is always so great to find. So hopefully you have a chance to see it soon as it rises higher up in our sky. Thank you very much for tuning in to another episode of our Sky Tonight program. We very much appreciate your support. And if you're in the area, please stop by the Museum of Arts and Sciences and check out a show in our Loman Planetarium. We have some great programs going on right now. If you want any more information about what we're doing, check out our website and tune in to our various social media channels. We're putting out some great content from all around the museum. So I got to say, happy Thanksgiving coming up. And of course... Happy stargazing.